Okay. Uh, I decided uh, for various purposes. One is to, in my in my consideration to to reveal more about the psychoanalytic orientation, be that Lacanian or whatever we follow in our school, based on Lacan and Freud, of course. Uh, I have done quite a few reading, readings of Lacan. And uh, uh, I, I can say that, uh, that uh, you know, some books were helpful, some, some of them, they, they assist one understanding what is what is the Lacanian orientation um, you know of course the authors they spend a lot of time reading writing those books but uh, you, with through these specific books uh, you understand better the Lacanian orientation because of the uh, stupidities that they write so I decided to make some pe stupid people famous. And uh, so before I start my seminars, I will show you one book and I will say why, because it's not just saying that something is stupid um, or that the author is a fucking idiot. Uh, but I will say why, what's mentioned in the book. And I will urge you to read those books because I realized that Lacanian orientation or Freud's orientation or the orientation to the breath, it, it cannot be understood without understanding what we have to separate ourselves from. So the first thing, if you allow me to share be, before I go to the interview, it's, it's this book. Uh, it is, I, I will make it bigger, but Between Vinigot and Lacan, a clinical engagement edited by Louis A. Krishna. Let me make it a bit bigger. Can you see it? I don't know, can you see it? Okay, so this guy is, is a responsible person for the Lacanian group of Harvard University. Okay, big university, you expect that there would be geniuses there. Uh, when you read this book, it gives a lot of knowledge but then at some point, I would just use this one point to, to show that, to show this genius Harvard guy that he's, he's an idiot, but he doesn't know it because he thinks that he knows everything. Uh, he says, when I supervise my, my analysants, sorry, my, the, my, the analysts that come to me, uh, I ask them Lacanian questions. That's the first stupid thing he mentions in the book. What is a Lacanian question? And uh, sometimes I ask them object relations questions. Sometimes I ask them in the same supervision that he's supervising Lacanian analyst or whatever analyst he's, whatever uh, uh, supervisee. He's asking questions that he thinks that they are related to Lacanian psychoanalysis and others that they are related to Vinicot. Of course, this is the typical American stupidity of the border. When you've got this sort of confusion, even in the sessions, be to choose between two, or even among specialists of Harvard saying between Vinicot and Lacan, it means that they have lost their desire and their point of orientation. So the concentration there is on the imaginary. What do I mean by imaginary? They are concentrating on the technique. That's why he's asking questions related to what he thinks is Lacanian, and then questions related to Vinicot's theories. But you cannot do both. You know why? Because Lacanian orientation, it's an orientation, it's not a technique. It's a subjective, uh, topology is a topo subjective shift of the analyst. It's not something that we're trying to shift and change and modify and callup. I think they've got this, this word, I think Serbian or English, uh, to fixate our analysis in a specific way. When they say that psychoanalysis, it has a specific method, specific ways to go every week, specific way to be happen, 
That's not psychoanalysis at all. It has nothing to do with psychoanalysis. It is not the patient or the analyst that, that has to be shifted to fit that technique, but the analyst to be adopted to the real of the symptom of the analyzer. And this adaptation, I'm responding to that idiot now, does not mean that, oh, with this analysis, then I will ask him questions of, of Vinigod, or with this analysis, then I will ask questions related to Lacanian theory. If you are doing that, you are because you are precisely an idiot. It's the fifth time I said that, but it's one of the most stupid books I have read for psychoanalysis. And people are reading it because they want to understand Vinigod and Lacan. What is between Vinigod and Lacan if you do the reading the way I did with this book? Between Vinigod and Lacan, it's always a bombastic idiot psychoanalyst who doesn't know where to stand, who doesn't know where his desire or her desire is. I met a lot of those, especially from the United States, some of them in England, and they say, I'm half Kleinian, half Lacanian. You are half idiot at, at half simpleton, to use this dated English word. Okay, so if you want to understand, pay attention. Maybe the whole book gives you information, and then you see the way they approach the practice, and they tell you this, this bullshit, this fucking idiotic stuff. And don't get me wrong about, say, fucking, because Freud's psychoanalysis became very conservative, and they stopped using the word fucking even though Freud started psychoanalysis about the guy who fucked his mother. So the word fucking, it's nothing. It's like drinking water for psychoanalysis. So this book, it's in the list of the most stupid books about Lacanian psychoanalysis you can read, coming from Louis A. Krishner, a Harvard guy, okay? To understand the geniuses of Harvard. So, Get it, read it, and read be behind the lines. This guy is so confused that in the same supervision, he's asking, he's shifting his position to ask object relations questions. Why he does that? Why he's putting the questioning on the imaginary? Because he cannot understand the transference. He cannot understand the symptom of the analyst. Okay? He's trying to get knowledge. He's trying to teach knowledge. That's why he's shifting from one master to the other. That's not the way to do psychoanalysis. That's not the way to do supervision for certainly. Okay, so that's my new, my small prologue. I would do that for every book, every single seminar I have. Now, uh, let's, let's go to share something else. Let's go to share a psychiatric interview. This interview is by the psychology department of the University of Nottingham, okay? And uh, they, uh, it's, it's, I think it's with actors, but they, they, so they said that it's very precise way to do scientific interviews. And, and uh, with, this, with these videos, they are teaching their psychologists and whatever psych psychiatrists they have there in the department. Okay, let's see what did they manage. Last time it was an actual psychotic patient. This one is a, I wanted to, to show you this interview that they use to teach, to teach people how to do, to conduct interviews with psychotic patients. Let's go. No, wait, I have to share with someone, apologies. Stop share, sorry guys. Share with sound, yeah, no. Hi, Andy. Do you want... Where is Andy? I'm the on-call psychiatrist for this afternoon. Can you... I got... uh, Penny, can you hear it? Okay. I got a call this morning from your family doctor. doctor thought it might be helpful. Fuck off. Harula had it on the speaker you record. Hi, Andy. Do you want to come on in and have a seat? I'm Dr. Taylor. I'm the on-call psychiatrist for this afternoon. I got a call this morning from your family doctor, because I think you went to see him this morning along with your mum, and I gather that things have been a little bit difficult for you. You've had some rather distressing experiences. 
So I think your doctor thought it might be helpful for us to have a bit of a discussion about that to see if I could help. Yeah. Would that be all right with you? No, it's fine. Would it be all right, Andy, for you to tell me a little bit about what's been going on? Well, you're going to think it sounds stupid, but my housemates are working for MI5. Right. And they're, uh, they're doing stuff to my brain. OK. And uh, they're, they're out to get me. OK. That must be very difficult for you. OK. Yeah. How long has this been going on for, Andy? About two months. Right. And how did you first work out that this is what was happening? I came home um, one time and, and they'd, moved the, they'd moved the TV to the other side of the room. Right. And I just I knew then. And, and what was it that you knew at that moment? That, um, that they were for MR5. Right, OK. OK. So it's been going on a couple of months? Yeah, the, the, this new lecturer started at right. uni. And, um, and he works for MI5. Right. And he, he basically drafted me, my housemates in, okay. turned them against me. OK. Yeah. OK. Now, I've noticed a couple of times while we've been talking that you've sort of looked round you into the room as if you're checking for something. Could I ask you what's happening at those times? Well, I can, I can hear them talking about me. Right. H who is it you can hear? Yeah. My housemates. Right. So that you recognise it as their voices? Yeah, I can, I can hear them all the time. Right. right. How many voices can you hear, Andy? Three. There's, there's three of them. OK. And do they sound real, like my voice sounds talking to you now? Yeah, it, it's odd. It's, it's, it's like I can, I can hear them when they're not here. Right. And so what, what they're not, and when they're not in the house with you? Yeah, it's like, yeah, like they're in the other room or something. OK. OK. And can you hear what they're actually saying? Yeah, they're talking about me. Right, okay. They're always talking about me. They're, okay. They're always commenting on everything that I'm doing. Right. It's Can you give me an example of what they would say? Well, like if, if I'm packing my bag to go to uni or something, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, be, they'll comment on that like he, right. he's left the house now. Or, okay, okay. You know. Anything else? Do they ever talk to each other, perhaps, about you? Yeah, that's what they do. I mean, uh, and now they know, they've sort of... They've sort of twigged that I, I know about them now, right. and they're, they're, they're saying like I'm, I'm making trouble. Okay. And um, and that they're, they're, they're going to sort me out. Okay. Okay. What about actually talking directly to you in the way that I'm talking to you now? Does that ever happen, Andy? No. Okay. So you've been you've been hearing the voices of, of your housemates. Have there been any other changes? Have there been any changes, perhaps, to the way you're thinking? Sometimes people tell us that they they're thinking changes in some way. So, for example, they might feel that they're getting thoughts put into their head that aren't their own. Have you had any experiences like that? Yeah, um, I do think things that that aren't me. Like they're, okay, they're okay. putting thing they're putting stuff in my brain. It's not. It's not me. It's not. I'm not thinking. So, so different like thoughts in your brain. Yeah, right. it's like it's stupid stuff as well. It's like the other the other day, I was just I suddenly just started thinking about some woman in Coronation Street. I don't watch any right, of that. Right, right. It's not your kind of it's thing not, normally. Right. They're not my thoughts. Right. Okay. And do you have any idea how that that's happening, or, or it's, who's it's responsible? This, it, it's MI five. It's this chip they've put in my head. Right. Okay. And um, I can feel it all the okay. time. It's okay. So, so you're getting thoughts put into your brain that aren't your own. What about a different sort of experience? What about the experience that somehow other people are able to know what you're thinking, even though you haven't actually told them? No, no. Nothing like that? They're just putting stuff in my... Just putting stuff. And, and can yeah. I just check, Andy, as well, that you're not getting the experience when your thoughts just stop altogether, like you have no thoughts left? No. If anything, there's too much in there. I wish right. I could unplug it. OK, OK. Just get this thing out of my head. Right. You, and you mentioned this this chip or this device in your brain. Do you want to tell me a bit more about that? Well, it's 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 a tracking device. Right. So they know where I am at all times right. and I can I can feel it moving around like right. rotating so you around. You can feel the physical sensation in your yeah. brain. Okay. Okay. That must be very difficult for you. I don't I don't know why they're doing this right. to me. I've okay. done nothing wrong. Okay. Can I just check, are there any problems, Andy, with the rest of your body? Any changes in sensation or any bits that feel different in any way? No, I, 
I feel fine. I'm not, right. I'm not ill or anything. I okay. just, okay. just want this thing on my head. Okay. But it sounds like a very difficult time for you. Can I ask you, Andy, how are you coping with all this? How's it affecting you? Well, I know we're leaving my room much. Mm -hmm. And I sort of have to wait till they go out to go down and get some right. food. But right. they've been doing stuff to my food now. Right. So okay. Well, what, what do you think is happening to your food? The, the poison in it. Right, okay. Are you actually eating much at the moment? No. Okay. Now, with all this happening, and this sounds like you don't feel very safe, have I got that right? Okay. Have you felt the need, I don't know, to take steps to protect yourself in any way? Well, I've, I've got a knife. Okay. And, um, I've got like a, a baseball bat. Right. It's, it's, it's just in case they get in my room. I just okay. I don't want to hurt anyone. I just right. feel like I've got to protect myself. It's like it's cornering me to do this. Right. Okay. Have you felt the need to use either the knife or the baseball bat so far? To take it out with you for protection? No. I no. I don't want to get caught. I don't, okay. No. Okay. It's just in my room. Okay. Has it ever got so bad, Andy, that you felt the need to hurt yourself or even kill yourself? as the only way out, the only way of coping with this? Well, I, I thought about getting some pills, but mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't leave the house, so right. I didn't, I didn't get anything. Oh, and when you say getting some pills, would that be to take an overdose of tablets? Yeah. But you've not actually done anything about that so far? Okay. In the past, have you ever had any problems either with your temper or getting into fights, being aggressive either with your housemates or anybody else? No, I'm, I'm not that kind of person. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody. Right. They're, right. they're just driving me to this. And, and can I just check again? You, you've not been in trouble with the police or anything like that? No, never. Okay. With all this that's going on, is there anywhere at the moment, Andy, that you feel safe? Um. My parents' house. Right, OK. And have you seen much of your parents recently? Yeah. I thought about going back there, but I, I don't want to drag them into this. Right. I don't want my five knowing about right. them. Right. And, and throughout this last couple of months, when you've had all these worries, have you ever worried that your parents might in some way be involved in this conspiracy? I thought about it, but um, no. OK. OK. Can I just check out a couple of, of background things with you, Andy? Your general health, is that OK? You generally fit and well? Yeah, I'm, I'm not ill. I don't, there's nothing wrong with me. Okay. It's just this thing in my head. Okay. I just... And you're not on any regular medication from your own doctor at this stage? No, I don't take any okay. pills. Right. What about other drugs? And by that I'm meaning alcohol, cannabis, pills, anything else? I don't, I don't drink much alcohol. Right, OK. And what about drugs like cannabis? Is, uh, is my mum going to know about this? No, I think it's something that's important that I hear about, but this is, wouldn't be something we'd be discussing with your mum. I smoke a bit of weed. OK. Would that be regularly, so most days? Yeah. And how much would you be spending on weed? I don't know, I'd get like a... get like a ten bag, it lasts mm -hmm. me a day or so. OK. So you have a ten bag lasting you a day of weed. Any other drugs? I'm thinking in particular things like speed or, or pills. Done a bit of speed. Okay. Is that on a regular basis, Andy? I used to I go out with my mates at the weekend and do a bit, but... Okay. When was the last time, Andy, that you would have had any speed? About a week or so ago. Right. Okay. Any other drugs at all? No. No. I don't know, but... I know, I know what you're getting at, though. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not... It's not the drugs. Right. This is... It doesn't matter how, how my face I get. This yeah. is constantly there. Yeah. It's always there. Okay. I guess the reason I was just checking, I think that's what you've picked up on, is that sometimes when people are having the kinds of experiences that you are, they find if they take certain drugs, it can make things feel a lot worse. And I just wanted to check if that hadn't been your experience. No. Okay, okay. I appreciate from what you're saying that you're really very worried about this MI5 conspiracy and that that's the cause of the difficulties that you're having at the moment. 
I just wanted to check with you, do you think it could be due to anything else? I mean, I've obviously met other people who've had similar experiences and sometimes they're extremely stressed, some people might be actually mentally unwell. And just whether, whether any of these things might be relevant to you at the moment? No, because I'm not ill. Right. It's them. and. I've read books on this as well. I don't. The government know about them. Right. They know that they do this to loads of people. I don't know right. how they can get away right. with it. Okay. I've done nothing wrong. I don't know okay. why they're doing this to me. Okay. I just want, I just want okay. to stop. Sure. And, and I think I can appreciate that. I guess what I'm wondering is whether you think there's anything that someone like me might be able to do to help you as a doctor. That sometimes meeting with someone like a psychiatrist or having medication or for some people even coming into hospital for, for a short time might be helpful. Do you think any of those things would help you at the moment? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm only here really because of my mum. Right. I've tried to, I don't want to worry her. I've tried to talk to her about it yeah. and she, she doesn't understand. She doesn't right. really believe me. I mean, do you believe me? Well, I certainly believe and that you're having a really difficult time at the moment. I guess what I'm not as sure about is what's causing this and I'm, I'm less sure this is due to MI5. I guess what I'm wondering is that perhaps you're not as well as you might be at the moment. I mean we've been through a lot of questions and what I'm thinking is we need to try and come up with a way of supporting you through this. So I'm wondering, because I know your mum is, I think she's waiting in the waiting room, it might be a good chance now to get your mum in and then perhaps the three of us can put our heads together, have a bit of a discussion about where to go from here and try and think of getting you some, some proper support. Would that be all right if I got your mum in? OK. OK. If you want to sit there then, Andy, I'll just get your mum. OK. OK. To, uh, I, I would like to play again the interview, but I will stop it to make interventions. Is that OK with you, Penny? I'm just wondering, is this... Um, presumably they're actors but they're probably working from a real script. It, yes, it's, a, it, it's part of the psychiatric, the psychological department of uh, English University. Yeah, I was just wondering if, um, if the people are actors. They are actors, yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, just uh, like the, the patient is actor for sure, maybe the... Yeah, okay, I, th good. I think the lady is a psychiatrist. Yeah. Okay, but they have, they have a script anyway from psychiatrists. Let me now decompose it a bit and then you can have your comments. It's a University of Nottingham. Okay. Andy is 21 years old university student who is seen as a catalyst due to concern raised by his GP. He's in the final year of his degree and lives in a shared room with his friends. Okay. Hi Andy, do you want to come on in and have a seat? I'm Dr Taylor, I'm the on-call psychiatrist for this afternoon. I got a call this morning from your family doctor because I think you went to see him this morning along with your mum and I gather that things have been a little bit difficult for you. You've had some other distressing experiences. The first, the, the first mention of the mum. Keep, it, keep that hand. Yes. So I think your doctor thought it might be helpful for us to have a bit of a discussion about that to see if I could help. Would that be all right with you? No, it's fine. Would it be all right, Andy, for you to tell me a little bit about what's been going on? Well, you're going to think it sounds stupid, but my housemates are working for MI5. Right. And they're, uh, they're doing stuff to my brain. OK. And uh, they're, they're out to get me. OK. That must be very difficult for you. OK. The first mistake, and I, I really apologize, there are ladies in the room, but I, I, I really need to say bad words. Okay? So, this is a psychiatrist, this is a doctor, and the best questions you can come up, it, it's, they are so stupid. So, listen to what she's missing. Wait. Listen to that. My housemates are working for MI5. Right. And they're, uh, they're doing stuff to my brain. They are stu doing stuff to my brain. And her response is... OK. OK. She doesn't care about elaborating. 
And why elaborate, elaboration is important if you have suspicion of psychosis? For two reasons. One is to create some sort of historicity. Historicity gives a cause and effect that I came from here, that happened to me and I'm here. If it, if it is a lie, it gives a context, a linearity to the body. So not to fall into the side of schizophrenia, which the body is disoriented. And her only response is, okay, okay, because for her interview, the fact that he's speaking about MI5, it's enough to do her own, her own things. He doesn't open up, he doesn't ask clarification questions. That would be very valuable. The, they're out to get me. Okay, that must be very difficult for you. Okay, okay. They are, this must be very difficult for you. This is a very stupid Americanized question or the empathy that psychologists you, used and to try to say, oh, this must be very difficult for you. That must be very stressful. So this, this is an emphasis on the feelings. So they try to get into your own shoes. Okay. So they're trying to create transfers by being, but oh, that's difficult for you. The question she should have asked is what I said earlier. So he can give her information, even though psychotic, paranoia, whatever, and that condensed thing that he keeps mentioning about the MI5 would be unfold and become a narrative. Okay, this is what she should have done. But because she's so focused on understanding the dangers, the diagnosis, reality and stuff, she's missing up all these questions. How long has this been going on for, Andy? About two months. Right. And how did you first work out that this is what was happening? I came home um, one time and... Okay. She's trying to ask him about the trigger, what happened? She's missing another question here. A very, very basic question. It doesn't matter if they accept it or not. She could have asked, let's say two months now. I would have asked, tell me more about your life two months ago. If you want to, if you are going to work with the triggers as, as she does, okay? ask about his life, what was going on? Maybe he cannot say, but pose a question. How were things in your life? Tell me about three months. What were you doing there? Ask these questions. Sometimes they don't understand. Sometimes the symptom is so powerful that the context is missing. That's why they, they are giving emphasis on the symptom. And by having psychiatrists like this and psychologists like this, that they ask nothing about it, so what we've got is a constant, powerful repetition of their symptom. And then the only thing we have to give them is techniques, usually CBT or behaviorism. And if these techniques, they don't work because they don't really work in, in difficult cases, okay, take medication. Ask him, what, what was going on in your life two years ago? That's, that's very human question. What, what was happening in your life? Um, one time, and and they moved the they moved the TV to the other side of the room. Right. And I just I knew then. And, and what was it that you knew at that moment? That um, that they were for MR five. Right. Okay. The the main signifier here, the main, you see. Usually, I'm very kind person, but when I hear things like that with people that. They study 10, 15 years to be psychiatrists or psychologists, and they come up with this bullshit that the average Cypriot uh, village, they, they have better answers for this. You know, you, you cannot just look at them without making fun of them. Okay, listen, listen to that, to what I'm saying. She didn't pay attention to the fact that the trigger there, it was the moving that they came and they move stuff. She's not answering, she's not asking anything about it. Look at it. 
one time and and they'd move the they'd move the TV to the other side of the room right. and I just I knew then. And, and what was it that you knew at that moment? That um, that they were for MR5. Right. Okay. okay. Moving of the TV going on a couple of months. is what spark. That was the trigger. Something with the moving. The signifier there is moving the TV. The first thing she should have done here is to elaborate further about the TV. What is it? Is it the gaze? Is it is it the moving to understand more about these two signifiers? Okay, but of course she's missing it. Of course she's missing it because. because she cannot take her close off, not for a sexual encounter, but the close of the specialist. She's so well trained to try not to listen to the patient because he's a patient for here right now, but to try to understand the historicity, the dangers and all this stuff. That's why she listens nothing. She elaborates nothing from the important things she's saying. That's why psychoanalysis is important for psychiatrists and psychologists, even for those who practice with CBT, because in order to practice good CBT, you have to be able to understand the structures. Yeah, the, the, this new lecturer started at uni, right. and, um, and he works for MI5. Right. He... They knew, knew the movement, of the TV, mark something new, the new lecturer, okay? Something is moving, the space is moving, his, his geography is moving. So he's, what he's telling us is that his body is becoming disoriented because objects with which he was able to, to coordinate himself in space, like Mangelan, you know, he was using objects, they started moving, they knew, the new thing is making me lo lose his body. I will ask more about this new lecture and about the TV, just to get more signifiers out, because she speak, he's speaking in condensation. If we don't analyze the condensations of the patient, of the analysis, they are going to be repeat, repeating the symptom. Five. Right, okay, okay. So it's been going on a couple of months. Yeah. The this new lecturer started at uni right. and um, and he works for MI5 right. and he, he basically drafted my, my housemates in, okay. turned them against me. Okay, yeah. okay. Now I've noticed a couple of times while we've been talking that you've sort of looked round you into the room as if you're checking for something. Could I... Okay, another stupid mistake that she did. I keep repeating the word stupid but uh, I think I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm repeating the word stupid not to say something heavier. Okay. She's missing, she's missing important questions now. The, one of the things that you have to do with psychotic is not to challenge them, but ask them questions. They have to bring in signifiers to, to, re, to be removed from this condensation of the, of the psychotic structure of the paranoid other that is constructed there. Okay. This new professor uh, kind of uh, take them into his team. Okay, be polite. How did he do that? Can you tell me? Ask these questions to, to make connections from one point to the other. How these things are connected? This guy is a counter in the gap, and then he's saying, they are MI5, he put them into my 5 and they just proceed. Ask him something between these two points of reference. The connection is MI5 with my roommates, MI5 with him. Okay, he He's able to make a, a connection. He kind of uh, put them into this thing. Ask how, how do you think he did it? Try to create a narrative. He's getting lost because there is no narrative. She's missing very powerful opportunities here. You know why? Just to verify her position as a specialist. Couple of times while we've been talking, you've sort of looked round you into the room as if you're checking for something. Could I ask you what's happening at those times? Well, oh, can... sorry guys, another mistake. Why is that a mistake? Because the MI5, uh, Penny can tell us more later. It's a secret service. 
And of course, it's, it's an embodiment of the gaze, of the persecutory gaze. And then the next question this idiot asks is, I have observed that you are looking, when I ask you in the room, that you are looking, blah, 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 blah. She is taking up this position, like, like observing his body and she wants to know why. That's a big mistake to do it. Take his signifiers, take his language. Don't, don't ask him questions in relation to what you are observing. He's suffering from the gaze. You don't have to embody it in, the terms of, in terms of his therapy. I can hear him talking about me. Right. Who is it you can hear? Yeah. My housemates. Right. So that you recognise it as their voices? Yeah, I can, I can hear them all the time. Right. right. How many voices can you hear, Andy? Three. There's, there's three of them. OK. And do they sound real, like my voice sounds talking to you now? She's implying that they are, might, might not be real. OK. There is other question. You, you could ask, for example, I can hear him talking about me. Right. Okay. Who is it you can hear? Yeah. My housemates. Right. So that, that you recognize... Recognize them he, because her concern is to make sure that he hear, he's hallucinatory, he's hallucinating or he has uh, delusions. But he's, she's missing, is missing another question because she doesn't give a fuck about context. What are they saying? Ask him, what are they saying? Ask him why, because with that question, he will start elaborating and creating a narrative. You need him to create a story so he can place his body in it. That's the first thing. So he doesn't fall into schizophrenia. We take him into paranoia. And from there, we elaborate his position with the big other. So, right, do you recognize it as their voices? She, she wants to make sure. Yes, I can. I can hear them all the time. Recognize it as their voices. Yeah, I can. I can hear them all the time. Right. right. How many voices can you hear, Andy? Three. There's, there's three of them. Okay. And okay. And then another stupid thing. I will ask. Yeah. Who is it you can hear? My housemate. Yeah. My housemate. Go on. Right. So that, that you recognize it as their voices. Yeah, I can. I can hear them all the time. All the right. time. How many voices can you? I can hear them all the time, and then that idiot instead of. I can hear them all the time. I will ask, what are they saying to you? But is there any moment that you cannot hear them? Is there any moment you, why? Because we can ask two sort types of questions. One that they are aiming at Jewish hands to understand the Jewish hands, and the other to see possibilities where Jewish hands is not there. And there are possibilities for the construction of a possible desire. She doesn't ask that. She says, how many voices can you hear, Andy? Who gives a fuck how many voices he can hear, if it's one or many? Does it make any difference to you? You hear, Andy? Three. There's, there's three of them. OK. And do they sound real, like my voice sounds talking to you now? Of course. She's saying, oh, do they sound real? I mean, yes, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm having the, 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 the suspicion that you are a, a schizophrenic, but I'm asking you, is it real? It's, is it like my voices, whatever? What is he going to tell you? He already told you about MI5 and all this shit. Why are you asking this stupid question? Implying again that he might not be listening. Assume that he's listening and ask him to elaborate it. We, you want him to construct a narrative to create a unique solution. So her orientation here, her aim is to verify that he's crazy. Yeah, it, it's odd. It's It's... It's like I can hear, I can hear them when they're not here. Right. And so what? What they're not and when they're not in the house with you? Yeah, it's like yeah, like they're in the other room or something. Okay. Okay. And can you hear what they're actually saying? Yeah, they're talking about me. Right. Okay. They're always talking about me. They're, okay. They're always commenting on everything that I'm doing. Right. It's, can you give me an example of what they would say? Okay, that's a good well, question. Like I'm packing my bag to go to uni or something. Mm -hmm. they'll, be, they'll comment on that like he, right. he's left the house now. Or, okay, okay. You know. Anything else? Do they ever talk to each Okay. With this, okay, right, right. Even when, he's when she's making some decent questions, she's not listening. She's cutting him to ask further questions because this is what is, what is in the script. 
This is an actual psychiatric interview. There are books that they say how to conduct the proper psychiatric interview. If I would have burned one book, which we shouldn't burn book, but if I, if, if I was evil one to burn one book, it wouldn't be Marx, it wouldn't be Hitler's, my camp, it would be these fucking idiot books about how to conduct a psychiatric interview. It's not even an interview. In the interview, you are listening. Each other, perhaps, about you. Yeah, that's what they do. I mean, uh, and now they know, they've sort of, they've sort of twigged that I, I know about them now. Right. And they're, they're, they're saying, like, I'm, I'm making trouble. OK. And, um, and that they're... She's allowing him now to speak a lot. OK, OK. And then she's starting again with this, OK, OK, right, OK, OK. And she's cutting him off. She gave him like a few moments to speak and start and elaborating with gaps and a bit of stuttering. But she doesn't allow him, she doesn't remain silent because she has to fulfill the prophecy. She has to ask all these questions to make sure that the specialty did his job. Shut up. He started talking to you. You pose a question, a decent one. Allow him to speak. Don't say right, right, cut him. What about actually talking directly to you in the way that I'm talking to you now? Does that ever happen, Andy? No. OK. So you've been, you've been hearing the voices of, of your housemates. Have there been any other changes? Have there been any changes, perhaps, to the way you're thinking? Sometimes people tell us that they, they're thinking changes in some way. So, for example, they might feel that they're getting... Sometimes people tell us. She puts him into universal. Immediately, she's removing him from his unique experience. And this, some, sometimes people tell us, implies two things. That I'm the specialist, the doctor, and immediately she's putting him in the place of, of the ill person. She's speaking from the position of the master, and the first thing she does is to, to kill his subjectivity. Sometimes people tell us. Who gives a fuck? Whatever they tell you. Who gives a fuck? You should listen to him. Thoughts put into their head that aren't their own. Have you had any experiences like that? So, they tell us this, 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 blah, 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 and then, did you have any experience like that? I mean, she's trying to put him into, she's giving him an example, and then she says, did you have experiences like that? She's trying to put him into this callup, this, this specific structure, going into him being ill. That has nothing to do with the unique solution with which a psychotic subject can construct very unique solution for their own life, his or her life. Immediately, she's putting the universal here, not in terms of solution, but in terms of diagnosis that he's, he's fucked up. Sorry, ladies, for the, the cursing, but that's how I do my seminars. Yeah, um, I do think things that that aren't me like the, okay, okay. the putting thing the putting stuff in my brain it's not it's not me it's not i'm not thinking so so different like thoughts in your brain yeah that's right. like it's stupid stuff as well it's like the other the other day i was just i suddenly just started thinking about some woman in coronation street i don't watch any right, of that crap. right it's not your kind of it's thing not, normally right they're not my thoughts she interrupted him twice to say oh it's not your normal thing oh, it's not your normal thing it, just shut up and listen. You could just have us gently, what are they putting in your head? Ask him. He, he even try himself alone to tell you what is happening, but pose a question, because if you pose a question, you are separating this condensed, let's call it psychotic paranoia fantasy that is constructed there. And by putting this question, you are elaborating, you are helping to elaborate and pose and bring forth more signifiers. Right, okay. And do you have any idea how that, that's happening? Or, or who's it's, responsible? It, it's MR5, it's this chip they've put in my head. Right, okay. She, she, he already talked like five times. And again, she's asking. 
and um, I can feel it all the okay. time. It's okay. So, so you're getting thoughts put into your brain that aren't your own. What about a different sort of experience? What about the experience that somehow other people are able to know what you're thinking, even though you haven't actually told them? No, no. Nothing like that. They're just putting stuff in my head. Just putting stuff. Okay. So that's from a psychiatric script. It's a question that they ask to everybody, everybody. Okay, you can see. What about this? Because they have to ask that to measure. And they ask these sort of questions to measure whatever, if he's here or whatever, because they are not listening. They are not listening. There was no point to ask this question there. And, and can I just check, Andy, as well, that you're not getting the experience when your thoughts just stop altogether, like you have no thoughts left? No. If anything, there's too much in there. I wish right. I could un unplug it. OK, OK. Two things here. One thing that he keep repeating, it's they're, they're putting things in my head. There is something we're feeding here, putting things in my head. He keep repeating that. OK, and then he says, just get things out of my head. Two things that he's repeating. Get this thing out of my head. Right. You mentioned this, this chip or this device in your brain. Do you want to tell me a bit more about that? Well, it's, it's, it's a tracking device, right. so they know where I am at all That's times. A busy I, can, I can feel it moving around, like right. rotating so you around. you can feel the physical sensation in your yeah. brain. Okay. 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 Even I'm... though she asked a nice question here, she allowed him to say two sentences. Immediately, she feels the need to say this empathic technique, which is so stupid. Right, okay, right, okay. Or to shake their most body mo and then... She says, oh, OK, that must be very difficult for you. It's the third time she's repeating that. And then basically she's cutting him off from explaining, from elaborating his own experience. I wouldn't take even my uh, a crippled dog to here to treat. It'd be very difficult for you. Yeah, OK, that must be very difficult for you. Why she's keep repeating that? Because she doesn't know how to elaborate what he's saying. That's her way to create a good friendly transference. Go and buy him a bit of souvlaki. It would be even better. I don't know why they're doing this oh, to me. I've okay. done nothing wrong. He, he, does, he doesn't give a fuck about her question. He's answering something else. He's asking, I must be very difficult for you. He says, I don't know what they are doing this for me. I mean, it's as if he's telling here, fuck off, you ask me this question. Of course it's difficult for me. That's why I'm fucking here. Okay. Can I just check? Are there any problems, Andy, with the rest of your body? Any changes in sensation or any bits that feel different? Are there any other problems with the rest of your body? What is applied here? Your mind is fucked up, but do you have... <laughs> Other problems with your body? Do you have fungus on your feet and your feet smell? Do you have a rotten teeth? Do you have a premature ejaculation? So she starts like these sort of questions, probably she's a doctor, of course, and she's asking with the pre precondition that there is a problem with your head, but are there any problems with the other parts of your body? Okay. Different in any way? No, I'm I feel fine. I'm not, right. I'm not ill or anything. I'm okay. Just, yeah, you are not, my friend. thing on my head. Okay. Okay. So what he's telling oh, us like here is I can feel my other body fine, but it's just the thought. Okay? He's, he's able to localize where is the problem. Difficult time for you. Can I ask you, Andy, how are you coping with all this? How is it affecting you? So this is the risk assessment. Oh. I know we leave in my room much, mm -hmm. and I s sort of have to wait till they go out to go down and get some right. food. But right. they've been doing stuff to my food now. Right. So okay. Well, what, what do you think is happening to your food? Okay. Before she asks about what the fuck is happening in your food, I I'm really sorry for for cursing. Actually, I'm not. Uh, 
Uh, but I have to say that I'm sorry because I'm 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 a gentle person, <laughs> not for her. Okay, she says she I'm not leaving my room. If somebody tells you I'm not leaving your room, you are not asking him this. Let me put it. Sort of have to wait till they go out, to go down and get some right, food. But right, you Andy, how are you coping with all this? Then, How's then it affecting you? Well. I know we're leaving my room much, mm -hmm. and I sort of have to wait till they go out, to go down and get some right. food. But right. they've been doing stuff to my food now. Right. So okay. Well, what, what do you think is happening to your food? Okay. What do you think is happening to your food? The first question she should have asked, because she's now she's trying to 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 verify about the risk assessment. So, because she's trying to to understand this. Risk assessment if he's going to suicide, blah, 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 there is danger and all this shit that they're doing. Okay. Even though he told her that the rest of my body is fine. The rest of my body is fine. He's not going to suicide. Like I had an analyst who was going to a psychiatrist and she said to a psychiatrist that he was thinking to die. She was thinking to die. And the psychiatrist was calling him 10 times in the weekend. I didn't call not even once. I was not worrying. I went, I enjoyed my food on the weekend. I did all the things I like. Why I was not worrying? Because she told me, I bought a new pair of Nikes. If you are going to suicide, you are not biking Nikes. So the psychiatrist didn't hear that. He heard the other stuff. So let's hear here. I have not been living in my room. I should have asked, what is happening in your room? What are you doing? Why? Why? Because I would have liked to see. I would have liked to see what this person is doing in the room, how they move their body in the room. What are they doing in space? And then go to the fucking food. If you continue with this food, you are going to end up with a very condensed, a condensed paranoiac, schizophrenic, whatever uh, scenario that will just verify the diagnosis. We have to break this by asking questions in the right moments, clarification questions to unfold it. And I sort of have to wait till they go out, go down and get some right. food. But right. and, because, and because she's failing to ask these questions, he is returning to the condensation of his symptoms, his paranoia. If we fail to ask questions related to desire, what is desire? To ask them to enforce these things. If we fail to do that, they are going to return to the symptom. Doing stuff to my food now. Right. So I, okay. Well, well, what, what do you think is happening to your food? The, the poison in it. Right. Okay. Are you actually eating much at the moment? Wait, 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 wait. No. She's, she's, okay. she's failing here. How are they posing it? Ask, ask all these questions. We ask all these questions, why? Because we know how this big other, this paranoid other is functioning. We want to embody him. We, we want to make him human. We want to turn him into a function. How is he doing the poisoning? He doesn't know. But if you ask him, he has to construct. It's as if you are asking somebody it's as if you are asking somebody. Let me try the microphone. It's as if you are asking somebody, okay, to be creative writers. He, he should have asked him that so he will be able to think and be creative to answer this question. How are they doing that? Okay. But of course, she's failing because she has an agenda, an agenda there that. A proper psychiatrist should have asked. With all this happening, and this sounds like you don't feel very safe, have I got that right? Okay, have you felt the need, I don't know, to take... She shouldn't have asked that. I got the feeling, blah, blah, blah. Ask him, how is your experience with all this? What, what, is, what is in danger? What is problematic, even better, what is problematic for you with all these things? She didn't ask him. She, she assumed and then she gave it to him. 
steps to protect yourself in any way. And because she's assuming there is a danger, she's saying about protection. Well, I've got a knife. Okay. And um, I've got like a baseball bat. Right. It's, it's, it's just in case they get in my room. I just okay. I don't want to hurt anyone. I just right. feel like I've got to protect myself. It's like it's cornering me to do this. Right. Okay. Have you felt the need to use either the knife? Another stupid intervention. What she should have asked here? She should have asked. What is the danger? She assumes that there is a danger. She knows that she, he has a bat and a knife, but this idiot who is asking questions, okay, remission of an unpaid water bill hanging on the refrigerator for months. She's She's asking, she's not asking, what is in danger? It's a basic question. If he feels threatened, ask him, what is in danger? Ask him to tell you more information, to put verbs and describe the movements and his position at the same time of this threatening big other. Knife or the baseball bat so far, I just, I'd take it out with you for protection. No, I, no, I don't want to get caught. I don't, okay. No, okay. It's just in my room. Okay. Has it ever got so bad, Andy, that you felt the need to hurt yourself or even kill yourself as the only way out, the only way of coping with this? Well, I, I thought about getting some pills, but mm -hmm. I couldn't. I couldn't leave the house. So well, she had to ask you a question. Are you going to hurt yourself? Oh, and when you say getting some pills, would that be to take an overdose of tablets? Ask Armstrong again. Yeah. But you've not actually done anything about that so far. Okay. So, if she would have asked the question, what is in danger and why you are protecting yourself, he, she would have helped him actually to start thinking that if you, if you name the danger, then you create a very basic structure of linearity. If they are threatening me because of this, this is a danger, then I assume this position. She should have given him a space of identification with a cause and effect, with a logic. Okay? And then because he, he will have taken that, because it will be his own question, probably in the process, he will have not be thinking about the pills. In the past, have you ever had any problems either with your temper or getting into fights, being aggressive either with your housemates or anybody else? No, I'm, I'm... Why is this stupid question? <laughs> he mentioned a knife and a butt, and she's still asking him if he, <laughs> if he thinks that he's aggressive. What the fuck do you want him to tell him? That he needs a tongue. He's already aggressive. He has a knife and a butt. I'm not that kind of person. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anybody. Right. They're, right. they're just driving me to this. And, and can I just check again? You, you've not been in trouble with the police or anything like that. No, never. Okay. With all this that's going on, is there anywhere at the moment, Andy, that you feel safe? Um, Good question. My parents. At least. House. Right. Okay. Brilliant. My and parents. Have you seen much of your parents recently? Yeah. I thought about going back there, but. I, I don't want to drag them into this. Pay attention. The parents, I told you about the mother in the beginning, but I don't want to drag them into this. There is something that is functioning as a name of the father here. Okay? He doesn't want his parents to be in trouble. That's his limit. He has a limit. Let's see if this lady... It's easier to care about guys. Next time I'll show an interview with, with a man psychiatrist. Uh, so. Yes, right. I don't want MR5 knowing about right. them. Right. And, and throughout this last couple of months, when you've had all these worries, have you ever worried that your parents might in some way be involved in this conspiracy? I thought about it, but um, no. 
another question she should have asked here, not to just verify that he's worrying, he's psychotic, whatever. She should have taken up the idea that, okay, there is a limit. He wants to protect his parents. Just ask a very basic, super basic question. Could you tell me more about your parents? Just very basic question because he brought a limit there. Don't just ask a sentence about his parents and then just bring them into your own idea just to verify that he's psychotic or whatever. Okay? Okay. Okay. Why to ask questions about his parents? Because he, he brought there a limit. Ask him this question to understand what is stopping him, what is contextualizing him, which is on the dimension of love and maybe shame. Can I just check out a couple of background things with you, Andy? Your general health, is that okay? You generally fit and well? Yeah, I'm, I'm not ill. I don't, there's nothing wrong with me. Okay. It's just this thing in my head. Okay. I just... And you're not on any regular medication from your own doctor at this stage? No, I don't take any okay. pills. Right. What about other drugs? And by that, I'm meaning alcohol, cannabis, pills, anything else? Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't drink much alcohol. Right, okay. And what about drugs like cannabis? I don't drink much alcohol, the second limit. Is, uh, is my mom going to know about this? No, I think it's, it's important that I... Third limit, important. Is my mom going to know about this? That's super important. You've got there a psychotic patient that mentioned a couple of limits that, that contextualize his body. And she, she's not going to pick them up, pick it up. I hear about, but this is, wouldn't be something we'd be discussing with your mum. Okay, she's saying I'm not going to discuss with your mum. Okay, would that be regularly, so most days? Yeah. And how much would you be spending on weed? I uh, get like a get like a ten bag. It lasts mm -hmm. a day or so. Okay. Okay. So wait, wait. Let's, let's put it back. Is, uh, is my mum going to know about this? No, I think it's something that's important that I hear about, but this is, wouldn't be something we'd be discussing with your mum. I smoke a bit of weed. Okay, would that be... You know, he doesn't want his mother. He, there is a sense of a limit there. I don't want my mother to know about this. There is something on the side of love here. Regularly, so most days? Yeah. And how much would you be spending on weed? She should have asked here before this weird shit, because she's trying to measure if he's addictive, if he, you know, the shit that they ask. She should have asked more questions about his mother to understand his structure, to understand what limits him, to understand the limits and the context of his love. It's very important from asking him this stupid question. Ask him why not. Tell me about your mother. What's your connection there? Why you don't want your mother? Because there is, the problem here is the gaze. This MI5 relates to the gaze. And now the last part of the interview, he's bringing the mother as another sort of the gaze that he does not want to appear as the bad boy in it. it it's a gaze that brings limits. And she does not pick it up. I get like a get like a ten bag. It lasts mm -hmm. me a day or so. Okay, so you have a ten bag lasting you a day of weed. Any other drugs? I'm thinking in particular things like speed or or pills. Done a bit of speed. Okay, is that on a regular basis, Andy? Well, I used to I used to go out with my mates for the weekend and do a bit, but okay. When was the last time, Andy, that you would had any speed? About a week or so ago. Right. Okay. okay. Any other drugs? The problem with the speed here, of course, drugs are not the best thing to do, but he says, we are doing it with my mates, which is, even though it is not the best practice to do, there is a contact, a connection with the social bond. I'm doing it with my friends. Okay. It's important. She should have asked more questions about his friends, about his mates, and about this connection. Drugs at all? No, no. 
I don't know, but I know I know what you're getting at. Though. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not it's not the drugs. Right. Yes, this is. It doesn't matter how, how my face I get. This yeah. is constantly yeah. there. It's always there. Okay. I guess the reason I was just checking, I think, is what you've picked up on, is that sometimes when people are having the kinds of experiences that you are, they find if they take certain drugs, it can make things. I guess she's doing the same thing. When people, she's she's getting into the universalist, she's getting to the place of the specialist, because she's failing to to hear his unique structures. Feel a lot worse. I just wanted to check. That hadn't been your experience. No. Okay. Okay. I appreciate from what you're saying that you're really very worried about this MI5 conspiracy and that that's the cause of the difficulties that you're having at the moment. I just wanted to check with you. Do you think it could be due to anything else? I mean, I've obviously met other people who've had similar experiences, and sometimes they're extremely stressed. Some people might be actually mentally unwell. And just whether whether any of these things might be relevant to you at the moment. Are you mentally unwell? Are you a fucking idiot? Are you a bombastic, crazy person? Are you fucked up in your head? Is your mind burned? That's what she's asking now. No, because I'm not ill. Well, yes, you are not ill. And I've read books on this as well. I don't. The government know about them. Right. They know that they do this to loads of people. I don't know right. how they can get away right. with it. Right. Right. Okay. I've done nothing wrong. I don't know okay. why they're doing this. Yes. To me. Okay. Okay. Of course, we see this TV girl. The Jewish is coming from the big other. The big other is becoming persecutory. She's asking not even one question to afford this structure, to place a structure. By affording these questions in the way I said earlier, we are going to see where the Jewishness comes. And by bring the signifiers in the process of analysis, or even to these psychiatric interviews, she, he will be able to place certain amount of Jewishness in these new signifiers of his narrations. But she's not asking that. She'll, so he's just repeating his persecutory ideas. I just want, I just want okay. to stop. Sure, and, and I think I can appreciate that. I guess what I'm wondering is whether you think there's anything that someone like me might be able to do to help you as a doctor. That some. Yes, if you should have asked the right question and listen. Sometimes meeting with someone like a psychiatrist or having medication or for some people even coming into hospital for, for a short time might be helpful. Do you think medication? That's fine. Hospital, also fine. But just make a, a simple effort to ask a proper question to listen to this guy. Do you think any of those things would help you at the moment? I don't, I don't know. Yes, I mean... of course you don't know. You're right. They wouldn't help you alone. I'm only here, really, because of my mom. Right. I, tried to... I don't want to worry around. The second time, third time, he's mentioned his mother. I'm here with my mother. I tried. I don't want to worry her. She doesn't pick it up. Okay, she doesn't pick it up. She, he doesn't want to worry his mother. Love, Freud tells us, love is one of the most powerful things that can co connect us with the social bond. She's not picking, picking that up. I don't want to worry. There is a limit there. The name of the father here, it's the love of his mother. I don't want to make, there is sensitivity in this person. Everything, whatever he says about my five, I don't want to worry here. There is something that limits him from getting into a psychotic episode. She's not using that to build a construction. Right, I've tried to talk to her about it. Yeah. And she, she doesn't understand. She doesn't right. really believe me. I mean, do you believe me? Well, I certainly believe, Andy, that you're having a really difficult time at the moment. That's very political, at least correct way to deal with it. I guess what I'm not as sure about is what's causing this, and I'm, I'm less sure this is due to MI5. I guess what I'm wondering is that perhaps you're not as well as you might be at the moment. I mean, we've been through a lot of questions, and what I'm thinking is we need to try and come up with a way of supporting you through this. So I'm wondering, because I know your mum is, I think she's waiting in the waiting room, it might be a good chance now to get your mum in. And then perhaps the three of us can put our heads together, have a bit of a discussion about where to go from here and try and think of getting you some, some proper support. So 
she didn't utilize the mother as what as what it means for this person but she wants to utilize the mother as a, as a proper psychiatrist to stop him and restrict him and verify that he's healed. And because he has so much respect of the mother, he will be identified as the ill person because nobody's listening to him. Would that be all right if I got Yeah, your bring your money in to fuck you and okay okay if you want to sit there yeah, yeah bring the mother in okay. to, so you are uh, to verify that you are ill so that's that's my response sorry i, I took it step by step and uh we've got uh, 20 minutes maximum for questions and any comments that you might have you can ask me anything you want Uh, yes, Marino. I made a few notes uh, while I was listening to this interview. Uh, three points, if uh, I can actually talk a little bit about them. Yeah. Okay. So drugs as a cause of a psychotic break. Not so sure about that. Uh, someone doesn't have, have a psychotic break. Suddenly, the onset happens suddenly. But the triggering may have taken place sometimes, sometime before or long time before. What's the... your question? Is a common no, question? It's a, it's a common. Okay, drugs they do they do they can cause psychotic breakdown if the structure is very fragile. Why? Because when somebody is especially is on the side of schizophrenia, it does not happen with paranoiacs, which is also psychotic, but with schizophrenics it happens. The, the experience of a drug, even marijuana, might change the relationship they have with their body. It can be the trigger, and then it goes on for, for years. Yes. The other point is, uh, am I allowed to, to use the word uh, stupid? I used it. OK. So, so you, you, be more creative and use your own word. OK. Uh, the most idiotic thing is to ask all those questions, presets, in order to uh, diagnose that he's having a psychotic break. And even more idiotic is to use a diagnostic manual and with numbers, statistics, to get a diagnosis. A diagnosis will actually give a body, but that does not give a solution to his problem. And actually what takes place there is giving a body that is not compatible with who they are. I remember a conversation I had with someone who had uh, quite an intense experience with psychiatrists. And he said that, uh, and I quote, the diagnosis, it's something that happens to you. That comes from a, psych a psychotic uh, subject. Uh, the other point is he, the psychiatrist asked if his mother and father are involved in this conspiracy, transforming his, trying to transform his safe heaven into something persecutory. This could result in completely losing his body because in his mom and in his mom house, he's a son. He has a place there. Yo, so this is comment. Yeah, of course. I don't have anything to say. It's your observations and respectful. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to, uh, to recite, no, recite is for prayers, to, to articulate your own voice and comment. Thank you very much. Somebody else? Where is Penny? Uh, yes, um, Elena. Who is she that? Elena raised your hand. Yes. Hello, Elena. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, I was just thinking better and after what you said in Marinos as well. You know, psychiatry does not care about the truth of each subject. Psychiatry is a normalizing enterprise. Okay, it wants to make everybody 
We say sí. there's a sí. certain mold and correspond to certain criteria. Doesn't care about the subject, subjective truth of every uh, person. You are right. You are right. And it, it, it's, uh, even though the psychiatric, it's very helpful with the tech science of developing medications and stuff, it is the way that it's applied that is problematic. That's why I said in this earlier in the seminar that even if you are practicing with CBT or medication, the value of understanding the structures and the symptom will even make your treatments better. Yeah, well, based on what we show now from this video you showed us, you, you can see that the psychiatrist, she doesn't care, she doesn't listen. This, this, uh, this psychiatrist, if she would, wouldn't be a trained psychiatrist, I think she would have served coffee in Starbucks. <laughs> Best case scenario. In Cyprus, not in England. Anyway, that's what I had to say. Thank you, Elena. It was very, very nice coming. Thank you, Elena. Penny Saturn. Yes, Penny. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Pedro, for uh, the presentation and marking all these points uh, to stimulate our thinking. Uh, there's, a, there's a few kind of little points that I uh, want to connect. One is the it's it seems to be the same structure is operating um, with. Uh, the Harvard professor Kirshner and the psychiatrist, uh, who, as you've, you know, laid the way, essentially they're displaced subjects and they're identifying with the discourse of a master. So they don't have access to these horizons that uh, for those of us that the discourse of the master hasn't worked, it wasn't sufficient. There was something in our experience that blew that structure uh, out sufficiently for us to be forced on the path that we've taken to elaborate something singular. But this, what it, the, the main point here is to say it's the same issue with Mr. Kirshner as it is with this structurally. It's the same issue with Mr. Kirshner as it is with the psychiatrist. So essentially one way or another, they're functioning from a script. Now, in her case, she's a nice woman. She's trying to be nice to him. And as you say, she's using these modes of empathy, but um, she's, she's functioning to a script. So when, when I heard the, 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 the discussion the first time, uh, his, his discourse was very authentic. Yes. So I, I was I was concerned about confidentiality because his face. That's why I asked the question. So um, I would imagine that this is something that um, they got the original script of from the um, from the patient from authentic patient discourse, because there was a lot of very valuable information in the way that his discourse was articulated. I don't think that you know it would have been written by somebody who doesn't know something about this yes so they may even ta have taken it from a an actual interview but without the faces so that's yeah. um and the thing something that i would say is uh for me um although it's ostensibly intended as a uh, as a, um, a familiarizing thing this thing of having somebody use your first name when they're a stranger is a terrible thing to do to a subject. Yes. It's a terrible thing. I personally can't bear it. Um, I can't bear it. And I've got more coping strategies than most. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes salespeople, uh, when they ask me, do you mind if I use your first name? I say, I, no, I don't give my permission for you to use my first name. It's a big invasion to use the name. Right, so it's a very big intrusion <laughs> that should be eradicated. The other, the other point about the drugs, uh, Marinos, it may be 
this is my perspective on it with different things that I've understood over the years recently. Um, this isn't a prejudice about drugs in any way. As you know, I'm quite interested in meditation. I think it's very valuable uh, for, for those of us who are you know, caught up in discourse in a way that we want things to be a bit quieter and have mm -hmm. the opportunity for new thinking. The, the thing is precisely that which frees a neurotic subject from the insistence of their super ego that, that keeps them anchored. With a psychotic subject, if you allow the discourse to, to lapse, they may have a disembodying experience from the discourse and not really be able to re-enter the discourse. A bit like what happened with Joyce, for example, where they say, where he says his body peeled off. So essentially, when I um, I've often recommended meditate meditative practice to, to actually thousands now of people on Quora. And I always recommend the Sadhguru meditative practices because the way that he guides the practice, A, it's very instructive and stabilizing, but it takes the frame of the body. So it's marking the subject's experience and the sensations relating to their body. So using a discourse to, to attach to the body, so using language in a different way. But if you're allowing the sub, if the subject is taking a, a drug that frees them from the discourse, then if they're too free from the discourse, they can't re-enter the social bond. So that's what I would say. So it's not, it's not a, that the drug is doing a bad thing, it's just to understand there something about the value of the discourse to anchor us into a reality that we can share with others, to have some common points of reference. It's, it's, it's a way the drug it is used that is problematic. Well, if you let go, the thing is, it's, it can be, although, I mean, I've had patients who've had drug issues, if you like, or eventually they, they, um, they came to me and their, their drug taking was, you know, causing sort of, de sort of destabilization in their life, not, not this kind, but generally in their social life. And eventually through the analysis, although it wasn't the aim of the analysis, they, they gave up the the drugs it's not the drugs themselves it's just even even a light uh experience of relief from that voice which commands us if there is no structure there to enable us where we're tied really to the social bond in some more fundamental way if it's only a signifier that we don't really we haven't really invested then um we don't have a starting point so for example, MI5, MI5 in that uh, interview, it's a, it has a stable point of reference. Somehow he knows what that implies, she knows what that implies. They're both British subjects. MI5, by the way, is like the FBI. It's the internal security service in Britain, just as the CIA, for example, and MI6 are the international security services for those countries. So there's some point of reference, they're fixed signifiers. If you're a neurotic, you've libidinally invested the master signifier in some way. So even if you have a drug episode, can be quite a big drug episode, you're gonna, your libido comes back to that. But if you haven't invested language in that way, then that's, I think that's what's happening for the triggerings that are associated with drug use. It doesn't have to be a very big drug use for that to happen. It just depends on whether other parts of you, your libido, your flesh, is invested in the discourse or not. And here we're talking about a subject that is not recognized by the discourse as anything other than a mass production. And as you said, um, at his parents' home, he is a son. At his mother's home, he is a son. He has a specific place. It's him and no other. He cannot be replaced whereas the discourse of the psychiatrist is for replaceable subjects that script would be used the same thing over and over and it's not going to depart very much from that because there's a fear to hear what the subject might really say that's um thank you for your time
Thank you, Penny, for your comment. Anybody else a question? Uh, yes, Eleni. Hi, I've got a question. Uh, in some point in the video, I think the psychiatrist told him about that some other people in similar situation are taking maybe medication or they are going to the hospital and the psychiatrist then ask him how what he thinks about it. But if I'm not mistaken again, the subject told her something about his mother and about her worrying. And I don't know, but I was wondering why the first thing that came I mean, in his mind it was again her, his mother and he didn't mention anything about how he thinks or maybe feels about because because his mother is the love of his mother is functioning as a limit if it wasn't for that love maybe he he could have gone to suicide and the psychiatrist didn't pick up that okay if it was me i will start from that love that functioning as a limit and i will help this person to construct whatever was there to construct to be part of the social bond Okay, the psychiatrist there is functioning only on the problem. Her desire to help generates only, it is generated only as long as there is a problem. That's why in the whole interview that I paused, she didn't pick up not even one thing that could be functional for, the, for this person and analyze it and elaborate it and establish it. I would have done the other way around, pick up these things that they are kind of holy for this person and built upon them. She's not picking that because she's trained to see what is problematic. Okay. And what is problematic there actually, it's with all this sort of interviewing, what is happening unconsciously, it's the verification. Let me use my microphone. It's the verification of the specialist. You have to be able to get away from that body offered by the specialist, by the degrees, by all the shit that they're going on in order to be hurt. Did I answer your question, Eleni? Or do you want me to elaborate more? No, no, I got it. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, Marino, you have one more question, right? Yes, please. Uh, Pedro, I uh, have a question. Uh, yes. When, when, um, so how dangerous it is mm -hmm. when someone is having a psychotic break to ask them if they try to kill themselves? Do you actually, is that, the person I consider it very dangerous because you're giving them a way out. Well, that, that's quite a general question, but if I had a, let's say, a psychotic subject in this sort in front of me, I wouldn't worry about killing themselves or not unless they brought it in. But my attempt would be to elaborate the very important points of reference that were connected to their experience of life. Like here in this case was mother. My mother, I don't want, to, not only mother knowing, but I don't want to trouble my mother. A person who is thinking actually to suicide wouldn't think of troubling his mother. There is something there on the side of love of his, uh, how they call sensitivity of making the other be happy. There are so many things to extract here to construct a ori an orientation beyond this sort of suffering. But you need questioning and you need a lot of signifiers coming from this subject. And the psychiatrist is failing because if you ask, if she would have asked this question, questions she will have to sacrifice the word specialist 
which is a very powerful identification for her. Yes, Penny. But I know the answer your question. Um, I think you, Penny, has yeah. a... This reminded me actually of um, something else that I was struck by in that what the subject is speaking about is thoughts being put in his mind, for him, his brain, but the mind. And actually he's right. That's what the, the, the discourse around us, that's what it does. He actually, he actually uses the phrase, I am not thinking. These are thoughts that they're putting in my head. That's true. I mean, that's correct. It, it gives us a good insight into how uh, we experience the discourse. When, when somebody is feeling persecuted by it, they understand it. When we're okay with it, we don't, we don't realize. But actually that's so. And even, even though she's well-intentioned in that sense, in some ways, um, this lady is also putting ideas into his mind. But he's very clear about what his ideas are and what is not his idea. So it, he, what he said there about the thoughts is literally correct. It's a, it's a good description that we wouldn't normally notice. If you, if you listen to advertisements, for example, it's, um, I, don't, I don't watch TV much these days, but um, <laughs> when I do, sometimes there's a lot of adverts, even during the day now, but it used to be in the evening about erectile dysfunction. As, I don't know if you have them in Cyprus, but there are, um, there are advertisements that are talking about treatment, often for erectile dysfunction. So you're gonna have a whole load of guys there being hypnotized with this mantra over and over of this idea of erectile dysfunction. When somebody wants to sell something to you, they're first of all going to give you the idea that you have this illness. Okay, and then they're going to give you their solution for it. This is all putting thoughts into one's, it, it requires quite a strong constitution of the subject in a political sense, like a country has a constitution. Okay, it requires a strong discursive constitution to be able to uh, ignore it. So the function of ignorance is a very important one here. We're constantly ignoring things that are not uh, they're not consistent with our desire. Somebody in a, in a, um, with a psychotic structure is losing their place from which they could ignore and tune out these things. And that's why they're feeling persecuted because we ignore from a particular subjective position. And that's precisely the place for, that we facilitate in psychoanalysis to be even more alive with our desire so that we can do it better, so that we can ignore better what is not consistent with our desire. And this getting ill is the, is the more we lose that place, we're not able to ignore and we're subjected to the imposition of thoughts from others, whether they're MI5 or any other um, around. With the, the... This psychiatrist, the way she was conducting the interview was, was not focusing on his desire, or this patient's desire. And if, if there is no focus on desire, then provided there is faith in the structure and on the ideal, Richard Klein, the late Richard Klein, our last president, he told me once that the symptom is an ideal. He was right. Because if you don't have faith in your desire, you, you devote your faith on the ideal. And then if you devote your faith of the ideal, adding now parenthesis from Penny that the Jewish sons that be, ideal, what is ideal? It's a Jewish sons that became a name of the father to which we are trying to identify or with which we feel a failure if somebody else carried, especially in the paranoia structure. So this indicates that our desire returns in the, in the form of persecution as long as we are devoted to this ideal. And this is what this, this psychiatrist is doing. Thank you, Penny. It just inspired me to say this. 
to intervention. Anybody else? Uh, one more thing. Um, last, about, last question. Uh, yes. Uh, about what Penny said earlier about um, uh, the political structure, political structures with regards to um, uh, asking these kind of questions. Uh, I think, I don't know where I've heard it, and I'm not sure if uh, this is uh, actually uh, in effect, but in Cyprus, for example, uh, uh, TV channels are not allowed to, to broadcast or make news uh, of people who committed suicide. What's the question? No, that's a, that was a comment. Okay. Suicide occurs when the faith to the ideal it's so powerful that it, the, the desire is sacrificed. So in order to preserve the ideal, anything that represents desire has to be killed. Even if it is a person itself with his own thoughts. That's why if Freud spoke about the shadow of the object falling upon the individual. Penny told me that, of course, that I, I read it six times, but it was Penny who brought it to my attention once. What is that shadow of the subject, of the object falling upon the individual? Is the shadow of the ideal? Is not the object A. Is the object A in relation to the ideal that is so powerful? And why it's powerful is because is because the subject itself does not remove it, does not remove it from that place. So in the worst case scenario, you've got suicide. In the second worst scenario, you've got the suicide by leaving melancholic for the rest of your life because you are not dropping that. Maybe it can be a lover or something, but that's the object A. The object A, if we dropped it, even if it is represented by a lover or something, it has a narcissistic impact on our mirror image. And what we are not dropping is the ideas, the narcissistic connection with the specular image we have for ourselves. Okay, and this is one of the, the, the way to test desire in the beginning of the session, but as sessions go along, if you are practicing. Yes, Elena. Petra, can you please repeat what you said about the idea as a symptom? I would try, I forgot, but it was, it was every, like every, every, every symptom is an idea. This is what Richard Klein told me a few years ago. He yeah. was right. And then I got another thing from Penny. He, she said that, uh, let me think if I remember. And I, how, I mean, she didn't say it like that, but Penny says a lot of things that she gives me the opportunity to elaborate them in my own way afterward. Uh, she says that uh, it was a, a something that is painful. And then in the process it became, it was, it took an axiomatic position and it was elevated at the name of the father. That's, that's the idea. And when that happens, it means that our true desire, because we elevated this symptom as a name of the father, and we are trying to identify with that name of the father, whatever was our true desire can only come into this circle, into this structure, as something that is like a nightmare, as something that is persecutory. Okay, yeah, thank you very something, much. Something that is alien to us. Yeah. Xenos, the alien that I mentioned, neither yeah. of the other, Neither of the same, but of the alien. The alien is a construction. It's not a reconstruction, as Marinos Magliali's mentioned in a couple of his essays, very nice essays, you have to read them, especially when he published his book uh, about the reconstruction of the drive. But it is a pure construction and creation of what your desire is. And what your desire is, 
it's an act and in the act you cannot be the object a of your own desire you can only be the embodiment of its act okay and in order yeah. to achieve that you have to be able to discard and that's so difficult to discard your own body what you've pointed to here Pedro I think is um, is probably the most obscure uh, kernel of the question of psychoanalysis how to liberate the desire of the subject from the melancholic ideal very nice Penny. We, Thank you, if, very much. you want me to call to comment Penny or yeah yeah okay. I mean in, in a way this is something that even probably we could do some more work on because that's the crux of the work entirely yes the melancholic ideal appears in the session when the subject they do not leave the object a that piece of of, of plinthes of their specular image in the mirror okay that's why you've got fixation the relationship that's why you've got melancholia because melancholia is the price you pay from not relief releasing this this object okay so you've got melancholia and complain and dissatisfaction when the emphasis is still a lot or not on the specular image and not the desire and the subject, the thing is, that the issue is, as, as I see it, is that the subject clings to this as yes. a way of stabilizing themselves. Yes, yes. And so this, um, the subject has to somehow come to a point to make a step to something totally new and unknown beforehand. And I think when you speak about the act, the act is something that happens to the subject in that way that comes from desire but the thing is how to uh, um, facilitate that happening in a more radical way and that's like i said that's the that's the work I think. in order to facilitate that in a more radical way the psychoanalyst if he's able or she is able to reach that point they have to be able to go beyond their bodies. How do you go beyond your body? By crossing the actual fantasy. And then the only way to have a body is your own act. There is no, it's a bit autistic. The act, I said, I, I, you remember, Penny, I said the, the act is perversive. Why is perversive? Because you go beyond, as Lacan said, that which have been a law. The laws is the laws surrounded the body. So it's it's only the act that gives you a body. And that act, concerning your question that you pose one of our conversations, how to make psychoanalysis uh, more more precise is when the psychoanalyst is living with his or her own act because it is that act that inspires and provoke others to come to this analysis. Desire is a tool to be utilized in life, not just in the session. It's a way of being. It's an ascesis. So you are monks and pilgrims of that desire for the rest of your life. I don't know if I answer or if I comment correctly, but thank you, Pedro. That's uh, it's helpful. Okay, because I'm a bit drunk, let's stop it here. I, need to go I have a question. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, yeah, La I comment on. last one, and then I have to go to the toilet. So, if <laughs> that goes. I'll be uh, that, 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 that's a real cut. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you all of you for those very valuable um, comments and um, interventions. Um, just a, a small comment about um, this right okay, she was uh, saying, the psychiatrist. Well, to me, it, it sounded like uh, she was even erasing what uh, uh, the subject was just saying. Like yes. she was uh, hurrying up 
to tell him, yeah, okay, now finish your sentence or something. It, it, it also sounds to me a bit ironic. In what way? Like, um, as if uh, she didn't believe on uh, the truth of what was just said. She did not believe the what? In the truth of uh, his words. But she she doesn't believe in the truth. She was she was trying to to put him into a context, specific context of of uh, he is dangerous of of being diagnosed of being ill. There is nothing there about the truth. The truth there it's it's related. It's it's trapped. It is tortured in a context of illness and normality. And this structure that you observe here is, is not actually about the patient, but precisely to verify the specialist. It is one of the ways that people, they don't come to analysis, psychologists, psychiatrists, because if they go to analysis, they have to drop up part of their symptom, which is mastery. They have to drop this title of being a psychiatrist of knowing, being blah, 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 blah. That's why, in my opinion, very few psychologists, very few psychiatrists, they can be proper psychoanalysts because they have to take off to lose their skin, to lose their body, the known body, that I say sometimes. In that case, the known body is the knowledge, is the body that they construct through their studies. And there's also the discourse is objectifying the patient. Yes. You, when, when we really listen to what someone says and allow ourselves to be influenced by it, then they become a subject. So that's, it's quite a big reversal. So the function of that structure, that normalizing structure, as Elena referred to, it, yes. is political, it is a political framework in order to bring the subject into line with the master did signifies. So precisely it would um, it would be there to foreclose that design, which as Pedro has you know named it very well as alien. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's very interesting, you know, that that's how it functions. Um, very interesting. The alien is something that is a totally new construction. It's not even a neologist. And remember, it, when, sorry, but um, yeah. when we're suffering, it means we're doing the same thing to ourselves. We are we are acting in the same way against our desires, alien, and that's when we suffer. It's because yeah. we're identifying with this uh, irony, foreclosure, repression, dismissing, containing, not listening. It means this is intrapsychic as well as uh, intersubjective. So it's it's a very you've really put your finger on something crucial there too. Sorry, Pedro. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's good what you're saying. Any more questions? No questions. Well, thank you, Pedro, very much. And we can uh, leave it here for tonight.